There's so much that goes into winning a flag. Well, that's a big deal. <laughs> that's a really big deal. The Leo Barry mark, which is obviously a pretty critical part of that day. To then see him on that stage, like that must have been pretty special. It just gave me goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah, so that was a pretty special year. Uh, welcome to Back Chat, powered by Fleet Network this season. The man that sits in front of us, Daniel Const, <laughs> has been at the top of our list, my list, my, my, not our list, my list, for a long, long time. And we are for privileged. Years. years. We've only been up two years. We are privileged to be joined by the great Mark Nikoski. Hello, Nico. How are you, mate? Hello, Mark. Sco. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Um, now, I know you don't like big deals. I know you don't like... And so... I won't go through your full career here, but we do ask the same question to every guest we have on the podcast. First question is the same. So I know you've played for West Coast for a long time. You're a West Coast man. You've played in grand finals. Uh, you have coached, developed, had a huge hand. And I've said multiple times on this podcast, Dan, mm -hmm. the hand in the 2018 Premiership yep. at West Coast Eagles. We know you've done a lot on the field. We know you've done a lot off the field. But for right now, I'm going to say I don't care. Right? I just want to ask you this question. We want to know your greatest sporting achievement, not on the football field. You're a premiership player. You're a waffle premiership player. Don't care. We want to know your greatest sporting achievement, not on the football field. Now, we have lots of sports stars through here. Um, we've had footballers that play poker. We've had footballers that uh, train pigeons. Yep. We've had card players. We've had high jumpers. We've had state under nines hurdle champion. Right? right? We've had... Beat you in the 40 metre dash just this weekend. You did, actually. <laughs> he, beat, he beat me. How? With his I'm legs. <laughs> with, <laughs> with, look at the calves. With his mind. Nice calves. Uh, Thanks. He, five for 5, five for 16. Sorry, 5 for 16. 5 for 16 under 12's grand final cricket. Not bad. So you can go deep into the depths of your yeah, mind. Yeah, wherever you want to go. Um, we've had athletics champions as seven year olds. We've, we've had it the lot. You, you, you know it, we've seen it. Give us your greatest sporting achievement on the football field. I can't go past. I'm an absolute basketball yes. frother. Yes. And I can't go past the three championships that I've won with the business. Is My uh, schoolmates, we have a basketball team that's been going for a long, long while. And uh, we have, over the journey of, I think it's been 20-year duration, won three championships. Wow. So that's probably yeah, the that's greatest good. achievement. You're a, you're a shooter, aren't you? Uh, no, I'm not actually. Um, I'm a bit more of a hustler. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, one thing that footy gave me as a gift was plenty of injuries, but I ended up getting my wrist fused at the end of my career. Yes. So I had to teach myself to shoot with my other hand wow. just so I could be a part of the business. Right. But yeah, so more so in the paint, hustling, rebounding. Um, Distributing? At times, yep. yeah. A lot of putbacks, but... Um, a lot of putbacks. That's probably my greatest achievement. I yeah. mean, you two have met before. Yeah. Apparently we have, yeah. So Dan, I've played Dan the, the Greek freak. <laughs> Greek freak, yeah. Dan Giannis. <laughs> <laughs> I've I played many years, um, Loftus. Like, every casual basketballer in Perth has done the rounds, or, you know, on the local re uh, leisure centres. Uh, Warwick for 10 years, Loftus and all that. So we, I'm pretty sure we've played um, at Warwick together. I did get um, a mate of mine who his daughter babysits for our house on a Thursday and he plays in the 35 plus seniors comp. Mm. So one Thursday he came to pick her up after basketball and he said to me, um, do you know, do you know Mark Nikosi? Cause obviously he knows like what I do with back chat and stuff. And I said, Oh no, I, I you know, know of Mark Nikosi. He's like, can you tell him to rein it in or something? <laughs> So he obviously had just played you and you must have given him the business or something. Yes, um, potentially, potentially. But I, I used to like talk a lot and I, cause I wasn't a great shooter, but I'd hustle and get into a bit of a shit talker. Yeah. A lot of shit talk. Are you, did you, uh, talk, do you talk on the court? He no, would have, would have, but he's changed. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I would have, I did. Um, in the early, after I retired from football that first couple of years when we had the coaches team and, um, some funny stories within that actually around a bit of chat. Yep. Um, one, of them I, one of them I entertain you with quickly was Thank you. Um, we played this team who were quite com um, quite competitive and a really good basketball team. Uh, we're at uh, Bendat Stadium then, and um, a bit of lip going back and forth between all both like everyone on the court basically. And anyway, I, I pulled up next to a opposition player. Someone was having a free throw, and I sort of looked at him and thought it was a good chance to lip. So I said, um, I was like, "You just make up the numbers on this team, right?" <laughs> And he looked at me and he goes, yeah, a little bit like your AFL career. Oh! <laughs> yeah. 
So that was probably one of the funnier ones. But um, there was blokes getting red carded. Yeah, I remember hearing I know. the stories. I don't know what happened. Praddy did something awful. Um, <laughs> Praddy, friend of the family here. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, have have mellowed. Probably what he was talking about was my competitiveness. I'd say right, um, right. Which okay. I think you look for those outlets when you finish professional mm. sport. Yeah. And, Unfortunately, Thursday night C division at Warwick is, is <laughs> yeah. where it takes place. You've, you've got guys that are like had a real rough day at work. You know, maybe the wives don't love them. Oh. Maybe like <laughs> they're just having the worst year ever, and then like they just see an opportunity to like elbow you in the face, and they take it. Daniel, so you don't. You know, I know. Then it doesn't mean doesn't matter you haven't played at the highest level, but that's called white line fever, and <laughs> it's something that all three of us share. Uh, <laughs> terrifically. Now, sorry to butt in the basketball trap, but <laughs> I don't want to get back to Nico. That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Nico. Wait, uh, can I? Uh, sorry, one more question. <laughs> Warwick, do you get the the socks or like the the medal? Because it's they're pretty stingy on the. Oh, yeah, if you win, yeah, the yeah, premiership we won stuff. At Warwick. We've won at uh, Craigie and June Lup. I think we only just moved to Warwick, sort of a season right. or two ago. I think they gave out mugs last time. <laughs> it's always a real yeah. letdown. <laughs> mug. Um, I'd be happy with a mug. Yeah. Marnikowski's football <laughs> journey. Uh, I think is a special one. And I've, again, like I said, I've spoken about the different ways that this has ebbed and flowed. Our relationship has definitely crisscrossed uh, in many different factors. Um, but I think it's a definite, I don't know if it's a full circle, but it is a circular journey, this one. And it's important to speak about your playing career and then what you've done after your playing career. So we're going to go back to the start. Uh, Martin Nikoski, a West Australian. What's life like growing up for Nico in WA? It was pretty lovely, mate. I um, had a really good upbringing, great family. I um, was very fortunate. Uh, obviously, my parents came out from Europe um, for opportunity in Australia and then um, had a family as well. And, um, yeah, grew up. Uh, Dad just loved footy, basically. He, um, he walked past Perth Oval one day and sort of looked through the fence and saw East Perth playing and um, fell in love with the game. And, and from that point on, he's still an East Perth member now, like 55 years later. One of the great men, yeah, old man. Yeah, Donny. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a fortunate upbringing. I loved footy. I was always quite small and skinny, so I was sort of a late developer in that, in that space. Um, but, yeah, just uh, – and, a, yeah, had a, had a great upbringing. In terms of my footy you know, as a junior, um, yeah, Warwick and then Kareen and, and Subiaco and um, probably got hit with little different bits of adversity as I got into my teens, but um, it was kind of the precursor to probably what was going to happen in my career, I suppose, but – no, it's pretty fortunate sort of upbringing, mate. The reason why it's such a big, sorry, Dan, no. to talk about the circle here is because I knew you as a player. Um, didn't know you in this time we're about to speak about, but I think you've definitely, your journey as a person that I've seen quite clearly has, has been a, well, not turbulent, but it's been a, you've, you've, you've changed. Like you've adapted. I don't know what the word is. But you have, I've seen you go from here to here to here to here and – the important part about this playing stuff is then how you transition that to post-career into the mindfulness program that I speak about um, in 2018 specifically, but what you've run at the footy club for a long time now. So uh, keep that in mind as you're listening along, what Nico sort of turns this into. But as a footy player, you're a rookie draft, eh? Yep, Pick I 25 was. in the rookie draft. Yep, it was a pick 25, was it? Yep. Was. Um So I was 19 turning 20. I missed out on two drafts before that, and I had already had shoulder surgery before that as well. Um, it was my first of four, but... Um, yeah, it was. I got invited down to train with the group actually after missing the draft for a second time, and that's back when you could train for mm. a, for four weeks, I think, before the rookie draft. So um, did that, and then got an opportunity and uh, played a year on the rookie list, and then got elevated in two thousand and end of two thousand and three, and then sort of the career started from there. Um, yeah, it was it was probably the rookie getting rookie listed was sort of the the start of. Um, well, actually, it's probably the continuation of a resilience-built journey <laughs> through injury, I suppose. Um, but, yeah, it was, uh, I was very excited. I was an Eagle supporter my whole upbringing, you know, um, born and bred WA. So um, to be able to uh, put on the blue and gold and, and have an opportunity, that's kind of all I was yearning for. I suppose that's all any sort of athlete should be yearning for is an opportunity. And um, I got given one, so... Yeah, went from there, I suppose. You played in Granny in first year in the Waffle, 2003. I did, 2003, yep, that's right. We lost to West Perth, maybe. Yep. Yep, um, and uh, yeah, that was a, a good eye. No, it's Subiaco, West Perth have some epic um, battles and still do. I like, um, sorry, I just like about your rise to footy is that you're a Northern Suburbs guy because like, cause I'm a Northern Suburbs person and all these footy players are all like, 
Vic Country, Scotch College, like all these like <laughs> Geelong Grammar. Are, yeah, yeah, all these like fancy kids College. and country kids. And then there's just a kid from like the northern suburbs. Yeah. It's just like you don't see it very often. Oh god, yeah. it's ten minutes out of the city. It's not from. Like, Mate, no, that's, what, no, that's what I the mean. Like, basketball team. I know. Yeah. Brother, you, yeah. well. you like the business. Um, <laughs> yeah, just uh, like I said, really fortunate because uh, you get drafted to anywhere. I mean, Will's a perfect example. So uh, yeah, it was it was a great opportunity to represent um, my family firstly, and then uh, a club that I loved and followed. And yeah, it wasn't through a lack of hard work though. Were you a backman when you were drafted? No, nah, wing half forward. Hmm. Yeah. So um, slight, like it's tall and skinny and uh, used to get pretty much clobbered a fair bit <laughs> whenever I went into a contest. So I was like, let's put him out on the wing and let him run and kick it as far as he can. And uh, that's what I was sort of rookie listed at. And then pretty much when I got to West Coast, they put me at half back to begin with. Yeah. Did you like loved seeing it. the game in front yeah, of you? Yeah, loved it. And it was great for building confidence within um, contest and then understanding what defence looked like and... Um, it's a really good spot for any young fellow to start their career, I think, because you get a good indication of how moments matter in a game and um, because when you're playing back, that moment can cost you a score against. So, um, yeah, it was a great sort of um, apprenticeship, I suppose, and ended up turning into where I was kind of sort of made my bread, I suppose, for the next few years anyway. Well, so the rookie list has changed a little bit in modern day footy, but back then like the rookie list was a proper, let's give a kid a chance. Yep. Maybe he'll work, maybe he won't. And West Coast had a pretty successful history. with like Dan Cox jumps off the page as someone that was a rookie, made their way, one of the greats of all time. Um, but you missed out on drafts before that, and then you were rookie listed. Does that... Is it like a chip on the shoulder type attitude? Like maybe not. Yeah, actually, that's but. a good. And you're probably talking about the competitive persona that I would have had, in, particularly in my twenties. It, well, it actually wasn't that. It was more back um, about just getting an opportunity and knowing that um, I'd be enough if I got given an opportunity. So uh, whilst it was uh, like I said, it's a setback, it's a setback, and it's you're not drafted this year and you're not drafted this year. It was. Didn't it never really factored in my mind that um, oh, I'm going to show you. It was more like just someone give me a chance because I I can do this. Um, so it's probably more that sort of angle, I mm. think. Third year on the list, you played 21 games, the most yep. in your career. Yep. Um, effectively injury uninterrupted. Yep. Back flank playing in grand final against Sydney. Yep. Uh, in your third year on the list. Yeah. I uh, yeah. It was just I was 21, turned 22. Um, I just gave me goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah, so that was a pretty special year and some really epic names that played for our footy club in that team. Um, and, yeah, once again, just was a role player, really, and um, sort of off half back, tried to give a bit of rebound and defend as well as you can and uh, found myself in front of 100,000 on grand final day kind of wondering what I was doing there, but um, <laughs> probably played one of the better games of my career in the end. Um, you had 17, kicked a goal. Were you in the back line? I was, yeah. I started on the bench, actually, that day. You? Yeah. I think something happened like uh, Paul Paul Williams maybe ended up on – we started on Embers on the wing and then he went to half forward and Embers got dragged to half back or something and then we had a quick swap, so I came off the bench. Because the bench was the bench in 2005. Yeah. There's a chance I could have been there for a good two to three quarters. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you come on, play a role – I have in my mind um, the 2005 grand final. It's the Leo Barry mark. It is, yeah. Uh, you were a couple of things, and tell me your memories of the day, but ones that pop into mind is that that mark, you're front and centre yeah. by yourself. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. The, uh, so the day is epic, really, if I start there. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the week is pretty epic, mm. and um, you don't really know how to handle it, especially if you're a young man. There, there's way more um, awareness and education on it now but it was kind of like i guess what we probably got told back then was don't play the game before saturday you know like <laughs> train hard um and that's kind of how you went about preparing for it uh, i remember the night before i was having difficulty getting to sleep because i was nervous and uh, there was something um way back that i'd read about james heard and he'd said something like oh, i i didn't sleep one night because i was so nervous and um but i ended up having a great game so i was just trying to tell myself that's like okay it's all good <laughs> I'm James Hurd yeah, I'm James Hurd he didn't <laughs> sleep and he played well you'll be fine um, and then I think I ended up put from memory put um, my headphones in and put James Blunt's new album on wow you're and, beautiful uh, you're beautiful 
and uh, <laughs> made, and fell asleep to that at about midnight. So anyway, I, I got enough rest. Um, but yeah, on uh, on grand final day, it's actually can still feel how uh, the your body, especially in that late in that last quarter, it's like it um, it wants to shut down, but you've got to find different bits and pieces just to keep going because you want to win. Hmm. I remember it was either I was either on. Um, Schneider or Buchanan at the time and this was late in the game and uh, we got to a stoppage and we literally just rested on each other we were just probably holding each other up at that point because we we're both exhausted but the Leo Barry Mark which is um, obviously a pretty critical part of that day um, once again I'm not sure if I think it was Buchanan he I was on him and he flew and I saw him go and I thought oh perfect I'll just wait here front and center because there's like 50 people going up in this contest this got a spill mm. and yeah just Obviously, Barry clunked it, and uh, the rest is sort of, you know, is what it is. I've there. spoken to you about that. Like, if you mm. look at the photo, everyone looks at Leo Barry's. There's, Eamon Buchanan is head down, like, tackling the pack. That's Nico's man. Yeah. Right. And Nico is in the perfect – you've coached for a long time now. Yeah. Could you have been in a better spot? Nah, I was yeah, I was waiting for it to spill. It was um, it was very snappable territory from there. On the so. left. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that didn't happen, so – did, um, did you know it was over when he marked that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, there wasn't. I could tell there wasn't long left um, because that was. Forgive me, I, it's a long time ago. But I think Coxie marks it and kicks it back in, mm. and that's yep. when Barry marks it. Um, and that was sort of a reprieve that we got another chance. So when he did that, I was like, oh, geez, I think that might be it for that one. How do you reflect on that after the following year? You, you miss yeah. out on 06, yeah. 05. What's that reflecting? Yeah, I'll tie that in later when we get to eighteen. But yeah. um, 06 was. Uh, started the year really well and um, up till the midpoint was having a great season again. Brownlow votes. And is yeah, that my you're, career too? You're, you're polling, <laughs> no, you polled against Richmond and Melbourne in that oh, first part go. of the year. Just a, Two you, games, you, you yeah. Were, you were sizzling. Yeah, I was, I was going okay. Yep. And uh, then I broke my ankle at the G against the Hawks and that was a 12-week kind of injury and basically got me back to like near on right on grand final week really, um, the week before maybe and I was actually fortunate Peter German at Subiaco gave me the opportunity to play for Subi in the grand final the week before, just to give me a game, just in case West Coast, if someone got injured or, or what have you. So I got to play in a Subiaco premiership that year, which was um, pretty grateful for. Hmm. Um, but yeah, sat through um, another epic grand final and obviously we won that one. So um, thoughts and feelings on it was just really stoked for the club and for all the players that got to play. Um, but it did spur me a bit for the next sort of few years in terms of trying to get back there. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, well, yeah, I can imagine, not know, but that 2005, six, and then seven, that period, incredibly successful period for the footy club. They don't walk away with three premierships in the end and, and you don't get one if being brutal, but, but 05, 06, 07, like what's it like being, like that, that's success, that's proper success in there. If you're talking about on-field, yeah, uh, it's it's a great feeling, and you, and you would know it, and you would know it too, Dan, with a particular way that um, with the basketball team, um, <laughs> of course. But it's uh, it's a good feeling knowing that no matter what position you're in, you can win a game, and that's kind of the feeling that we had through that period. It was um, when you just know you're good, and you get challenged, and you just are like, okay, cool, they're challenging, but we're going to be good enough to win. So it's um, it's kind of the um, the sweet spot of of high performance in sport really when you when you've got a team and a culture that's playing really great footy mm. on field um so yeah it was it was great to be a part of absolutely i think 07 we when did we bow out in the prelim or uh no it got done in straight sets we lost qualifying port, port yeah and then you lost to collingwood in extra time that's right yeah um, do, you, do you remember we've had um other 06 and 05 guys on the pod saying like you'd walk out just yeah like exactly like we said you just knew that you could come back and and win mm. do you remember um do you remember the comeback against Geelong in 06? Bloody oath, I do. You, yeah. you sort of started it. Did I? Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, with That's what? The goal. Oh, Kicked yeah. A huge goal. Outside yeah, yeah. 50. Massive. I do remember that one, and I do remember celebrating it too, actually. <laughs> um, I think Stakes kicks me the ball, and I remember um, saying to him, not on that day, but in, in a lot of games, uh, if we get caught in that position on the ground, like, look in board, I'm going to be standing there, kick it to me. And so he did on this particular day. And then obviously I slotted it and went celebrated and then proceeded to sort of go say to stakes, like, this is what I'm talking about. So if this happens <laughs> again, you. kick it to me. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> which we had a bit of a laugh about. Stakes would have forgotten. Yeah, there was um, actually yeah, a Geelong supporter when we walked in at half time. And you, you know what skilled is? Oh, it's not skilled. GMHBA. I was probably there, mate. You Just might have been up. the one. Mm. Potentially, you were. <laughs> yes. But anyway, we were walking in at half time, and I think we were nine goals down at that stage, and all the Geelong crew were hanging over the um, the race, and um, obviously spraying us and telling us how crap we were and what have you. And I remember locking eyes with one supporter, and he was saying what he was. I couldn't remember what he's saying, but it, you know, we locked eyes, and obviously the game. We come back out. The game happens. We win. And we were walking back down the race. And to his credit, he was there again. Um, and we sort of locked eyes. And I kind of looked at him and went. <laughs> and he was, he was just shaking his head. He was just <laughs> distraught. So um, at it least was he a rocked pretty, up. A pretty special day. Yeah, I thought it was like. Fronted up. Yeah. Great credit. Because he could have just left. Yeah, he would have been like, I'm not looking at that guy again. <laughs> um, you just gave him the MJ shrug. I just, yeah, I didn't know what to say. We we're all sort of probably in a little bit of shock ourselves. But that might be the last time we won there, too. Probably. I never won there. <laughs> yeah, I never won there. And I started this year. Yeah, that's a stat to check. 2007. A massive moment in your career. Will Schofield starts the football club. And I don't say that because this is our podcast. Uh, you were number 31. Uh, I was. Heroics, uh, grand finals, everything you did on the footy field. And you changed the number six, 2007. And I don't know if you remember, and I'm not wearing them, I should have. They're still upstairs. Uh, you had a pair of bathers with the number 31 on them. No one else had them, so I'm not sure how you sourced these ones, but they were West Coast bathers, had the number 31 printed on them, and there was some sort of ceremony we <laughs> held at the, start, at the start of training where you, you not my jumper, you gave me the your bathers. Yes. Your dick togs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope I washed them for you beforehand. You certainly did. I yeah. wore, either wore them for, but they're I, still, I still have them. Yeah, so I, I went across to number six because... I loved Banners when I was growing up. and um, Drew Banfield. Yes, Drew Banfield. And he was obviously um, going to retire and sort of approached him on uh, one of the celebratory um, days after the grand finals. So saying, look, mate, if you do decide to hang him up, <laughs> um, I'd love to wear number six. So, yeah. And then fortunately for me, someone um, jumped into 31 that would be, I was proud to have 31. So hence the... Um, the handover of the speedos <laughs> <laughs> and uh it started the well, i guess what we termed the 31 brotherhood really yes um so who had it before you the speedos the, the 31 ah uh, <laughs> i someone had the, uh, just the manufacturer had the speedos. 31 yeah, yeah. but the brotherhood been kane munro yeah me? maybe yeah the brotherhood was martin and right okay. and this isn't a this isn't a this was something we spoke about the 31 brotherhood mm. like for years. Yes, absolutely. And, and now, yeah. I used to always smile when I, as the bathers, like, um, as it degenerated, the word, yeah, <laughs> sort of over the years, and the drawstring was gone, and like half your cheek was hanging out when you went to the pool, I always would smirk because I thought, how powerful is the brotherhood? He's still yeah. rolling with them, and they're not even covering his, his butt. <laughs> it's a funny story, but I think it identifies probably some of your strengths and perhaps something that you rubbed off on me as a player and as a teammate, that connection with your teammates. And whether you win, whether you lose, grand finals, whatever, injuries, all that sort of stuff, how important is that side within a football club, the connection piece? Because this, again, will come on after and you go as a coach. Mm. <clears throat> skills, talent, best players, all that stuff. Connection, where's that falling yeah. along with um, Once again, like for the, for the best teams – on the planet they they continually get this they continually get that piece in the off field side of things within um the playing group and that comes down to a lot of things it comes down to rec recruiting the personalities that you get um how hungry they are to, to succeed and how driven they are to succeed and those types of things so if you get a group that yes everyone's different but there's this collection of um i suppose drive and intensity towards a common goal you generally get um, good humor and um, connection off field so I mean through through that part we had that obviously I'm talking directly about you and I but also with the the bigger group and um, it does formulate a big part of success as a as a team but there's different ways to connect right off field that one of them's giving your bathers to someone <laughs> um, another one's going to have lunch with them another one's um, having a, a a deeper conversation with them when you're sitting in the ice bin um, there's so many there's so many different ways to grow that connection so that you have that trust. And I often think of um, a teammate of mine and, and a good mate, Adam Selwood, we would get to stoppage 
and we'd be both be on dangerous forwards and they generally go to try and block so they can separate you and we wouldn't even need to talk we would just sort of look at each other and know what was about to happen so um and that was a part of uh, a great friendship off the field so mm, that's interesting the the on-field connection built with off-field sort of connections mm. um 2007 you missed all oh, you, you uh, missed a lot of that year almost mm. all of it with shoulder injuries um 2008 you played most games nine you missed with the groin injury uh 10 shoulder like injuries have played a big yeah. part of your career yeah. Did, what do you reflect on that yeah so um i what do i reflect on that i see that as i guess my journey in professional sport and um i'll often say to injured athletes that i see or injured footballers that i see at work that you don't quite understand now when you're in it going through it but it's it's setting you up for a bit of a higher purpose when you finish and uh it was part of my resilience build i suppose as a as a person and sometimes some people need to face more adversity to build that resilience um, than others and and then there's obviously adding the layer of perspective to it like we're just talking about sporting injury we're not talking about you know um, deep illness or anything like that so mm. um yeah but it uh, was challenging. It was kind of got into this vicious cycle of um, just get going, start playing good football, get injured, have surgery, do rehabilitation, get back, find your feet, get going, um, start playing good football, get injured, start again, sort of set up, which was, was difficult to um, handle because there's, there's a couple of ways to get better at something and that one of the main ones is doing it. So <laughs> when you can't do it because you're injured, it makes it difficult. And you see others start to progress and develop themselves. So being in a competitive team, you um, quite naturally just feel like you're getting left behind a little bit. So, um, yeah, but long-winded answer, it, it sort of helped me um, probably develop a different side of who I am um, off field. Did, did you have to learn to get good at rehab? Like after having injury after injury, or is it something that you always had? Mm. You generally get good at it by it's like if you if we shoot more free throws, we're going to become better free throw shooters. So yep. you go into rehab, you go into rehab more <laughs> um, from injury. You're going to get better at it. So especially when a couple of them were just repeat shoulder um, reconstructions, it's sort of like oh, I know what the process is here. Let's have surgery. Let's get it moving. Let's strengthen it up. Let's get some confidence. Let's play. Um, so, yeah, you do, you become more efficient. The, the people that you're working with, the physios and the doctors understand you a little bit better. They know what is going to help, what's not going to help. So um, you get better at it, but it's not ideal. You had some inconsistencies through this period mm. with injury and so, you know, form and in and out of the team. At some point in there, towards the sort of 2010 range, they thought, get him out of the back line, we're going to, start him as a bit of a forward in 2010 you did it for a bit but then got injured yes most of 2010 yeah 2011 career best year pretty close you kicked 41 goals playing as a small forward yeah uh it would have been it's up there with the start of 2006 probably yeah um but yeah the i started i'm really fortunate mate the the club have been um, particularly loyal and um have given me that opportunity in in um with the opportunity to play AFL football so there's probably some times there where you know I think if I was maybe at a different club it might have been thanks it's time to go hmm. um, but yeah they gave me an opportunity to swing back forward where I was originally sort of recruited at and uh, probably in that 2010 period before 2011 actually found a, a, a different purpose than just football which was um, helping other people and it was the first time in my in my AFL career in my professional sporting career that I had worked out that if you actually invest in others around you, it inadvertently makes you a better athlete as well. Um, I think sometimes we can all become really like honed in worrying about ourselves and whether we're going to play and if we're going to get another contract and that sort of thing that we forget that investing in other crew around you can actually make you better. So there was a few guys that. Um, were learning half forward too so we all sort of did it together and um a couple of them were, were younger rookies and uh yeah so that's where i sort of first worked out that i like this side of sport 
and yeah, had another shoulder operation halfway through 2010 and worked a lot with those guys for the rest of 2010 and then uh, into 2011, just sort of, I don't know, I got a clear run at it, I suppose, um, and had a pretty good year. Yeah. So the reason I built up the being a backman, half back flanker, gun, kicking goals, but he, he could lock down. He just had himself, Adam Selwood, Martin Nikoski, playing on dangerous forwards. He, he knew what to do. He was mm. a he was a good backman, a great backman. Some point in 2011, I'd made my way into the team pretty regularly and um, was playing deep back. And Nico was a fully fledged forward. Like I said, 41 goals, kicked six against Richmond in round 20 in that year. Got a taste for it. Yeah, he was. He, well, I can tell you how much he got a taste for it. <laughs> I def- know where this is going. <laughs> there's, a def- there's a defensive stoppage, right? Okay, who knows who it's against? Deep in it, it's it's sort of red time. Um, you, you can't let him score. Yep. It, the pressure's on, but like I've just demonstrated, Nico knows what he's doing. He's been there, done that. Mm-hmm. Um, he would be able to teach me what to do. We're at this defensive stoppage, and um, I'm on my man, as Backman does, and I'm looking around, making sure everyone's set up. And I hear, which I think can be described <laughs> as some sort of squealing. <laughs> right, so I'm, so I'm not sure what, but <laughs> help! Oh, help! Help! Which... As a as a backman and as a teammate, you want you tell people if you you don't know what you're doing, just scream out and and yep. use your voice. Well, well, this <laughs> player on the field was out screaming for help, 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 and I'm there going pretty young player like, hey, hey, settle, settle, <laughs> oh, settle. Like, what do I do? What do I do? This player, of course, is Martin Nikoski, right, <laughs> right, and I'm standing there going, Nico, Nico this is in game, middle of game, like. Very tense situation, clearly. <laughs> and he, he goes, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I'm like, Nico, you fucking know what to do, mate. You used to be a backman. And he's like, changed completely from help to, oh, yeah. Oh. And just, just like hand across like, back. you'd forgotten what to do back Yeah, then. I had a little bit. The bright lights of playing forward had me completely <laughs> blinded in a defensive 50 stoppage. And I remember it clear as day too, mate. And you were my calming factor in that moment. It yeah. was great. It was like, mate. You've done this millions of times before. Relax. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, it, I have. Um, that was at the G, I think. We we're playing at the G. Yeah, in memory. But that's funny. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good memory because it either. I love it. Well, because further down the track, we, we you know as we'll speak about pretty shortly, the mindfulness stuff that we really worked on hard. It's about being able to think about what's happening in the moment and really get your mind onto uh, focusing on a point in time, and that might be exactly what you're doing. It's manning up on a man of not worrying about you should be a forward, you should be up the field, should be kicking goals, worrying about what you look like in the mirror. This is what forwards <laughs> do, right? Backman just get the job done. And mindfulness, I didn't know it in 2011, but we were practicing mindfulness at this stoppage. So yes. this is why I've never let you forget this, forget this story because it's a great example of being out of one, someone not initially not being able to block out anything and just completely panicking and having no mental strategy whatsoever, screaming help. I can't stop laughing. Props uh, to you for asking for help. <laughs> yeah. A lot of guys you know, are just the first thing they say too. Like if yeah. you don't know what you're doing, ask your teammate. Yes. You know, so that's what I was yeah. doing. Yes. You could have just gone on and do whatever and then yeah. get butchered. There's so many parts of this story and it's a funny story, but like communicating, uh, talking to each other, Understanding your role, all these things that we would teach down and the trust. track. Correct. And trust. Trust. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, it's a classic story because yeah. it's funny, but it's real, right? Uh, that year, you kick 41, you play great footy, you play, we play in a prelim together, and that's your last game for West Coast. Is yep. that right? It is, yeah. A uh, couple of pre season games, and that's when I did my hammy. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Hammy um, tendon. Yeah, hammy tendon against wrist. Adelaide in the. Um, Nab got the, Nab the cup, final yeah. or whatever. Actually, you, a, you connected with me. Yes, you I did. did. You kicked the ball to me, and, and then I the kicked a nine pointer and earned three hundred bucks goal. for Korean Junior Footy Club or yes. whatever they used to give him. And, and then did my hammy. Sorry. That's right. I, Thanks I for the, lowering your eyes, though. I'm honouring the, the lead up. <laughs> I hit you. <laughs> yeah, you did too. <laughs> That's amazing. We both I think just I potentially that. would have gone to you afterwards again and gone, mate. That's always on. Keep looking for it. <laughs> the Brent Staker, the Brent Staker one, probably. But so. That, that that's that's it. Yeah, it was. That's it. Um, <laughs> the hammy was a it was a, it was a solid one. Obviously, tearing it off the bone, and then there was a few complications with the repair, and it kind of set me back twelve months. It was about fifteen months before I played again. But uh, and then yeah, played a couple of games at Subiaco, did my wrist, 
and then that was a fusing yeah I had if, to get it fused um if you didn't fuse it you, you're gonna so you lose. can't bend it any more than no, that. that's it wow yeah. that's why you jump you can't that's why I had to follow through no that's why i had to teach myself with the right. other hand. that's pretty incredible you taught yourself to shoot with the other hand i love basketball <laughs> <laughs> you um you got to play in ireland as well uh, yeah, we played in the international rules. Yep, um, at the end of that season in yes. 2011. Yeah, that was we got smoked by Ireland. They played were, for Australia. I know. It's yeah, pretty yeah. special. Very, that very is. fortunate. And um, I didn't, I don't, didn't, I don't, not super familiar with the rules of the game. And um, but I didn't know that they handed out yellow cards in that yeah. game. And you, you go I on. I got one. Yeah, I. You do? Ray Chamberlain, I think it was. <laughs> yeah, Razor. he was a yeah, yeah. razor that he should. Um, no, one guy was doing up his shoelaces and I walked past and just give him a little nudge and that got you oh, yeah, that got me sent off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've done it previously before uh, to Stephen Milne and he had a different reaction. His was quite a funny reaction actually. Um, <laughs> what did it was a centre bounce and you know when you could line up on the square yes. and we're lined up on the square and he was on his playing on him. He was one of he was one of the best small forwards you'd ever have to play on. He was a jet. Gone. Yeah. Um, along with Cyril and Aaron Davey and, and those guys. Which you played on all of them, yet yeah. defensive were, stoppage. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, and anyway, he was doing up his shoelace and I was sort of giving him like a little nudge with my knee, just trying to annoy him. And then just before the umpire threw the ball up or bounced the ball, he leant across, pulled my shoelace on my boot lace, undid it and then took off. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of got my own um, yeah, bit of karma. He undid your shoelace. Yeah, because he was trying to do his up, right? And I was preventing him. And he finally got it done and then he whipped across, undid mine and took off. That's, that's a veteran move. It is. It was a great move. That's Stephen. That, I feel like that's the sort of operation <laughs> Stephen Milne was running and it's very smart, very good. Did you um? Do you also like get involved with Telethon a fair bit? <laughs> I did, yeah. Yeah, what, what was the... Um, what, what, sorry? what a great cause what a great cause yeah, of course great cause and you do things for <laughs> for raising money for a great cause of course yes. um yeah. I hadn't seen this, by the way. What? Do you know what we're talking about? Well, you have to take your shirt off. And that's what you're talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, no. I just I looked at a clip, and all of a sudden the crowd is chanting, "Take it off, take <laughs> it off." And next thing you know, Mark Nikosi's <laughs> shirtless at the at the um at the telephone. At the live, telephone live on Channel Seven, re reading out donations. Yeah. that's elite. I think if I think we got the donation doubled um, for doing it, but very I, good. It might have been the precursor to what you see now, where everyone has to take the shirt off when you watch Telethon. So um, <laughs> really, yeah, that, that I was. I've there. never I've never watched it. All the all the neighbors, oh, all, all the. Um, Home and away actors just like rolling around with no tops on. Nico was the guy that started it. <laughs> oh, there you yeah. go. Good but job. anyway, I got the donation doubled and that was the main thing. Um, Good on you. So 12, 13, um, two years effectively on the yeah. sidelines with injury. And yep. what's it like calling it quits? Were you done mentally, physically, everything? Yeah, the, the vicious cycle that I talked to you about of the injured rehabilitate play, I was um, – each time that happened previously, it was – Yep, all right, let's get surgery, let's fix it, let's go. Uh, when I did my wrist playing for Subi, I, and I, I was 29, nearly 30, it was kind of a, uh, that's enough. Yeah, that's mm. enough now. Um, and I felt that and I knew that and I was probably too old to really keep on going with what my body was doing anyway. So um, I got to finish with um, Sellers, which was great. And, and it was obviously a transitional period at the club because quite a few guys finished that year. I think Embers may have finished and Kerry may have finished and Wush left and um hmm. but yeah it was yeah that was I was exhausted. What's the transition like from that moment? Um knowing your career journey now, this is why it's important to sort of speak about that, to what you then went on and built um as a coach in development and then onto the mindfulness programs that you ran at the footy club. Um what's that Yeah, I like? like I said before, I sort of started to develop a interest in helping those uh, in helping people really it doesn't need don't need to be a footballer but um and that started through 2010 and uh was passionate about continuing that on and i didn't know how that looked whether that looked like um being a part of the well-being space or be part of the coaching space i wasn't quite sure so i was fortunate enough to be given an opportunity by the footy club um by Niz and Voz and, and simo as the new coach to um be a part of that group really and um, be upskilled and continue the passion that I had for for helping players. Did and you people. know what you were doing as a coach? Uh, it's early on you're really learning a lot. Yeah, a lot. 
Um, help. Yeah. There's no, you can't squeal help. Um, you can in a different manner. Um, but yeah, you, what you, and it's probably, and this is only my experience on it, but for, for those crew that are finishing whatever their sporting career is and they're heading into coaching, it very quickly goes from being all about you to being all about them. And you got to work that. You got to work out how that looks and how that feels. And once you've sort of done that, I think you're more, you're more open to uh, the understanding of all of it and how you can get the best out of someone. But uh, yeah, in the early years, I lent on um, friends and senior players to assist me uh, with with teaching our younger blokes. Uh, Tommy Barras being the first fellow that came through the doors, but and. Yeah, you're just learning, it's, which is fresh and exciting because you're new to a career, really. Is it at a point when you're coaching early that you think like you wish you back playing or because you're around the club all the time? Uh, and that's probably part of that process where, the, where you're going, and I was talking about this before, uh, you've got to differentiate between what used to be and what is now. And yeah, there's the, the reward that comes from coaching is not really um, anything probably unless you're the top person it's not really anything superficial it's kind of like you're sort of working hard behind the scenes and then your success is just their journey and their success so um becoming used to that a little bit too because previous to that it's like you do a good spoil or you kick a goal and everyone claps you for doing something good (laughs) and uh yeah it's a it's a different sort of reward yeah so you don't get a clap or a pat on the back but what makes you proud as a coach then like what Oh, mate. specifically, like what sort of moments or players or so much, all yeah. of it, yeah, all of it. You just, yeah, especially in those development roles, you are given an opportunity with a life, really, with someone's life and their and their dreams and their hopes, and um, you got to work out how you can nurture that and how you can um, develop that, but also be really realistic with. Um, with them as a person. And um, I mean, a lot of the stuff you would know, Will, but it stems from ha- developing a really, really strong relationship with them to begin with. And uh, and then it all sort of takes off from there. Uh, but yeah, that was probably the best way I can describe the, you have a huge responsibility because you've got however many players you're coaching, you've got their, their dreams and aspirations in your hands. So um, it's a lot of pressure. Well, it is. Yeah, it is and it isn't. It 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 is because of the the nature of elite sport, but um, it also isn't because you can just do your best, really, as the coach and as the as the as the teacher and as the student or the player. So, uh, and and I guess if if the platform and process that you implement with them is correct and there's some talent there, you can expose it and and they can have a good career. How much do you lean on your time as a player and everything we just spoke about as a coach or do you try not to do that or do you... No, a lot. In the early phases, early stages, a lot. Uh, our coaching was different. Yeah, it was different. It was it was not... Um, How we were coached? Yeah, hmm. yeah. You might have got... The, you got definitely got the, um, the back end of the transition of coaching method and uh, it was probably a little bit more fear-driven back when we were playing mm. versus um, being a bit more yeah, understanding and um, trying to create a sense of, of belonging for the person and, and um, giving them a, a, an environment that's going to make them successful, um, which is, is funny because it'll depend who you ask. Like if you ask some old-timers, they'll probably say, we're not hard enough today. Um, and then if you ask sort of the new age crew, they'll sort of say, well, don't go hard on me. So it's... it's um, Finding the balance, and there's still personalities. Like every personality requires something different. Um, some require a bit of tough love. Some require uh, a whole heap of nurturing. Yeah. But I do reflect on on that a lot, on the way that um, I was coached, or the things that I picked up from different um, coaches and mentors along the way, and how I can implement it, or how I could implement it as a coach. What about the mental side, and specifically mindfulness? Um, when does that start coming in? to your thinking the way that you do things was that as a player or was that something you found as a coach yeah no i um towards the back end of my career i used to um speak with dr julia butt who was um the a4pa 
um, assigned psychologist at the time, just around like performance anxieties and how you can get the best out of yourself. And I was always trying to find a bit of an edge with different pieces of the program. And um, she introduced me to the concept of it and sort of went from there, I suppose. My yeah. recollection as a player, um, which I was through this entire period where you had the switchover was for probably maybe the back end of Wusha and then s certainly as Simo started, we, we tried a lot of ways to work on the mind um, and, and it's probably become a bit more popular and spoken about now in 2023, end of 2023 now, but this is sort of 2014, so 10 years ago almost. There was a lot of different things we did. We had psychologists come in. We had, you know, and like clinical psychologists. We had behaviour scientists. We had, you know, business people. We had people from other sports come in. We had coaches. We, you know, we, we were trying everything to get better, like you said, find an edge. Um, but specifically when you took over and started running a mindfulness program, was that after 2015? It was. Yeah, we, we introduced it, mate, as a coaching group and a department in 2018. Yeah. At the start of it. Um, I think Richmond had had some great results the year before, mm. from what I remember, and sort of looking at finding that edge. And uh, yeah, so we just, it was a, and I know you speak really fondly of it, and it was, it impacted your year for sure. Um, and everyone would have a different experience with how it looked and how it felt. And it, um, yeah, it was basically about educating it and then um, providing a platform that once again was safe and there was um, opportunity for people to explore, you know, a different part of, of I suppose, their um, program, you know, in an edge that may or may not help. It's, it's a tough one to measure. Uh, am mind. I getting better at it? Mm. Am I not? Am I? Um, but, uh, yeah. Can you explain what it is without, I know you'll have IP to kind of protect from West Coast point of view and, and definitely we're mindful of that as well. But like basically, like what 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 was what was it trying to do and like what was it? What yeah, was the mindfulness program? So many definitions of it. I yeah. guess the way I had it explained to me, it was the, uh, your ability to be completely um, present in a moment um, through, I suppose, your sensory um, connection with what's happening in this space and uh, giving you an understanding and awareness of sort of what's happening um, yes, around you externally, but also what's happening internally, whether it's within your thoughts or within your body. Uh, and the the way you go about, I suppose, becoming more mindful is through a meditation practice. It gives you more opportunity to um, develop moments of awareness so that you can have more moments of presence. And was that on or off the field or both? What do you mean? Was the mindfulness program in place just for performance on the field or was it... Oh, it depends who you ask, probably. Um, I'm asking you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think it's. I think it's probably. Well, not f from my point of view. It's f for both. Yeah, mm. absolutely. It. Um, yeah. What a what a wonderful skill to be able to develop and harness. You know, whether it be emotional regulation or um, understanding more about yourself or um, recognizing that you know on field you're not perfect and mistakes going to happen how long do you hang on to them before you let them go and allow yourself to be free again all those sorts of the reason i ask is people listening why some people won't have ever heard of mindfulness ever and when when you basically mapped it out to the group in 2018 i hadn't really either we tried a lot of different things and they were trying to make the mind better and trying to make us mentally stronger 2015 we played in a grand final started poorly uh crowd uh, the moment, the scoreboard, the heat, e every external factor got a hold of us and we played like absolute dust. And it wasn't a physical thing because we were a good side that year and we were a good, talented, physically strong, fit side that just went to absolute water on the biggest stage. So for me as a player, when this first, when you start, exactly what you just said, just imagine like walking into a group, um, 40 players, tried all these different things, nothing's really working because 2015, that, you know, we were doing something then that didn't work. So Nico, past player, has gone through adversity, is a coach, goes, boys, we're going to roll this, we're going to do this mindfulness program. And I think it sounds pretty fluffy when you first hear it. You're like, that, how's that going to make me a better footballer? I want to, I want to beat my man on the, on the field. <laughs> Being present, staying in the moment, a, a way of centering your mind, like shut the fuck up, please. Like, I don't want to listen to it. And you that, you see what I had to deal with? <laughs> exactly. And that exactly right that that's the challenges to it right getting buy-in from the group absolutely and um so 
yeah, and then it goes back to your program uh, and the way that you deliver it and make it authentic and help the people that you are explaining it to understand that this can benefit them. And um, it was a whole team effort within that footy department in, in explaining what it looked like, what's the science behind it, how's this going to help. Um, but yeah, I guess it's probably a, a good lesson in, um, which is probably one of the little offshoots of mindfulness, but having a bit of a beginner's mind with with all of the things that you entail in your life, right? If you, um, I suppose, pretend like you're seeing them for the first time, you might see something in there that um, could benefit you versus just sort of looking at it probably a little bit um, superficially. But it uh, was a challenge and we had a a lady come in and she gave um, a really good uh, explanation, ran a few great sessions and we just sort of went from there with it. Was there a point in the season where you where you could start to see like, oh, this is like actually starting to click for people? Once again, not really. It's a difficult one to measure and uh, every player would have had their own experience with it. Uh, I, there's one funny story from um, Mark Lacra who was had a similar um, yep. attitude. <laughs> attitude or belief that Will had um, with you just what you just heard and uh, was kind of like, how's this going to help? you know, come on, mate, sort of thing. And it was, that, I tell you what, I'm very fortunate because these guys were always really respectful um, of me. And, you know, there could have been times where they were like, that's enough, can't we go? Yeah. But, you know, through the whole journey that I had, um, uh, the coaching w- with Will specifically, but coaching the rest of the group, they've always been really respectful. And I've been very grateful for that. But anyway, it was sort of mid-season and um, we, uh, I was at uh, Nippon Fair having some sushi or Great. something. Yeah, Nippon, Do you remember Nippon Fair in Suyako? And um, teriyaki, no skin. Yeah, that's it. And uh, <laughs> anyway, I was sitting on one of the high stools Yuck. there, and no, um, Lekka popped up, getting some sushi as well, and sat next to me, and I was sort of talking about fishing and something. He was buying a new boat, maybe. And uh, <laughs> he, it sort of the conversation paused, and he looked at me, and he's like, "You know this mindfulness stuff?" And I was like, "Yeah." He goes. I think I'm actually getting it. And I was like, what do you mean, mate? I nearly fell off the stool. And um, he goes, well, I'm just finding, you know, within games, I'm, I'm having moments where I'd normally be really lost and I'd be scrunching my brow up and I'm actually becoming aware that I'm in that space, in that moment, and sort of finding a way to sort of help myself get back into the game and, you know, what I can actually sort of be a part of or control in the next moment. And I was like, oh, that's, yeah, you go. You know, it's, it's great. And once again, back to probably what I said originally, um, the part of your role as a coach is, is, whilst that was nice to hear, it's, it was not, I didn't need the pat on the back. It was more like we've provided, a, we've, as a footy department coaching group, we've provided an opportunity for our players to get better. And um, they've been open enough to have a go and then they've found some results within that. So would it be fair to say that mindfulness on the football field is and giving you tools to stay focused and in the moment um, that perhaps without mindfulness techniques and whether that be – and we can speak about some of them, but it's giving you the tools to be able to handle situations better and be clearer and be in the moment. Like how, how does it make you better on the football field? I think, well, it, it allows you to – I mean, I'm talking probably from my own experiences and then with the guys that I coach, but it allows you to become – um, a little uh, more okay with the fact that not everything will be perfect on a football field or a basketball court or a tennis court or wherever, whatever your sport is or whatever your business is really but acknowledging that it's okay and and that moment's passed it's it's an awareness of okay what can I do right now to to, to help the team or help myself in this situation um, and it'll be like I've said before it's different for every person There's different ex- it's a different experience for every person and, and how they go about um acknowledging those particular types of moments but um there are many tools and techniques that that athletes can use in this space to to keep themselves centered i suppose what sort of things were were we doing in 2018 Mm. we're doing breathing techniques we're doing a lot of breath we're doing a lot of body scans um we're doing open awareness practices you know like um you'd be surprised right and um, how good are kids at at being present like young kids they're just so completely present that they hear a plane coming you wouldn't even hear it like there's a plane (laughs) what (laughs) like how mindful are they you know um but the open awareness practices are great because you can just go and sit outdoors and there's birds chirping there's cars driving there's waves crashing if you just take a moment to 
hear what's happening in that moment. But we we did a lot of those sorts of things, I suppose. Mate. They're all baseline um, foundational sort of exercises that you would find in any mindfulness app or mindfulness mm. program. We, I mean, I've spoken about it before. You may not want to, but we, we, we were doing pre-game mindfulness, which was something hugely different to our routine. Um, we would uh, hear Simo's address. My whole footy career, right, Dan? Um, we would warm up, we'd be sprinting around, we'd be tackling, bumping, Simo would bumping chat each to other. us, Wusher would chat to us, you'd have seen your players in your ear, and then you go out and you get yourself fired up and you go and play, right? Get the music pumping. Yep. All of that, none of that changed. It was always the same, but we, we at one stage in 2018, I think every game we would have a mindfulness session and it was, uh, it was optional, I reckon, in 2018. You could opt in or out, but pretty much everyone was in there. We would be in a room, lights off, doing a mindfulness session before games, including the grand final. I think people who are listening along would find that wild because I think, I don't know, you're looking into a football club, you imagine everyone down there yeah, rough and tumble. Yeah, hyped up. Yeah. Grabbing each other by the jumper and smashing yeah. each other. We would sit in a room in silence with the lights off and Nico would speak to us. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? But it's... Um once again, the, probably the transition or the transformation in where sport's going and people trying to find an edge with programs and those sorts of things. And Praddy was really big um, in helping us with that when you guys travelled away. Mm. And he was a big part of um, big part of those moments that you talk of. And, and also Lukey Webster at different stages too. So, um, yeah, it, uh, once again, it's just providing a, uh, an opportunity for the person to find the level of... Um, connectedness with the moment and a dark room might work for you it might not work for you you might like to um walk out onto the arena and and do a practice that way um mm. it uh it's once again it's probably individual individually specific you've um you would have done a lot of research then of <clears throat> excuse me like techniques that sporting clubs and coaches are doing around the world is there any that you just like just completely outrageous that come to mind no um, more successful uh Everyone sort of seems to be doing quite a bit of the same sort of from from the research and the education that I've had on it. Um, <clears throat> Wasn't it a big part of the Lakers with? Um, oh, with yeah. Well, we're, we're talking back in the Bulls like days. Phil Jackson, yeah, and he's Sorry. probably a bit of a pioneer. And we're, we're talking about a, yeah, we're talking about a practice that's been around for thousands of years, right? Like it's it. Um, Phil Jackson used to go like full native Indian, um, like. Sort of, tr- it was like a Zen master, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he'd, he'd so deep. he sort of had that. He would get the bulls. I mean, there's his his books are great to read if if that's your flavour too. But he'd get the bulls to lie down and do meditations. That's like mid nineties. Um, I remember doing that. But yeah, yeah. Do we not do that? Where yeah, I, I remember lying down and yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm saying like in terms of um, anything that's uh, maybe that's current now that's different is the only one that I remember coming across which was speaking to a, a, a guy in the states was he was talking about he wasn't he wasn't actually quite he wasn't fond of it but they're talking about sort of the hypnotic way of right. um yeah enhancing performance but that's kind of hypnosis as as conversation got this mindfulness whole thing took me it took me six months to get my mind around so if you're listening along and you're still thinking don't know how that practically looks well the best example i can think of is the 2018 grand final 2015 start poorly as i spoke about <clears throat> have no mental tools to be able to deal with the external pressure and um, mindfulness and the techniques involved allow you to well they attempt to allow you to yes accept that everything's not going to be perfect but also get yourself in the moment and and ignore external vibes like the scoreboard like the crowd uh, or even just acknowledge that they're going on and still be able to focus on what you're doing. So 2018, five goals down um, in a grand final. It's happening again. That That is something that I've spoken about since that day. Um, and it's the reason why I speak about you and your program, Nico, and why I think that you have the biggest hand in us winning that. And I understand that you'll be sitting <laughs> there going, well, there's lots of other reasons. And yes, there is lots of other reasons. Lots of other reasons that teams win. But the ability for the collective group to ignore a five goal to nothing grand final, you don't come back and win those in regular season. You don't do that in preseason. You don't do it in scratch matches down at the. You don't come back from five goals to nothing and win. To do it in a grand final, uh, they need to be. That's not just luck or skill, even. We had mental strategies to deal with that. And I remember feeling on the field that 
it wasn't really a big deal. Well, that's a big deal. <laughs> that's a really big deal. The fact that, that you were five down. Five what? down. Yep. So in terms of practical examples of mindfulness, would that be a good one in, in terms of dealing with ex- ex- externalities? Well, yeah. I mean, that's your experience. That's a good call. Yeah, that's your experience in it. And um, I don't know what it was. I mean, that was, it was probably a shared experience for a couple of guys, definitely. Um, I don't know what the collective's experience was with it. But um, once again, you're right. There were so many other factors at play. What, a, what, what an epic year. Um, what a spirit and culture that was sort of just permeating through the whole group and um it's one of those ones you can't measure but it's it's great that we were able to um have confidence in the fact that we had the strategies in place to win that day Mm. yeah how do you reflect on 2018 yeah it uh i spoke about earlier rounding it off um in terms of the the grand finals that i've been a part of but 05 was what it was. Um, we lost and it was really disappointing. 06 was amazing for the club and the players. It was tough personally to miss it. And 2018 was kind of like, ah, I understand now. Um, that it's so much that goes into winning a flag. And it's far greater than just the 22 guys that get selected on that day. And it's probably because I got to be a part of a, a great footy department for at that stage it'd be year four or five um, that I'd been doing it where it was like man I see that guy in the department do so much work and then I see that guy and I see that guy and I see that guy and then everyone's doing so much work and then you guys go out there and you win and you do what you did and then everyone's out in the field and I was sort of looking around going I'm okay now I'm all good like I can this AFL thing I can kind of separate myself from to some degree because I feel like it's all just rounded off perfectly it's not necessarily about um me being up there with the medal around my neck it's about being part of the the bigger um collective of people that have worked so hard to provide a platform and an opportunity for these guys to shine and and do what they did in 2018 so um yeah that's what i remember at the day i remember having a few big hugs um with yourself and tb and coley and a lot of the backs um and then maybe sharing a beer or two. Because uh, I got goosebumps there. Uh, that was good. Um, and you would have seen guys like mm. TB, you mentioned him walking through the door to then see him on that stage. Like that must have been pretty special. Yeah, that's the reward. Mm. Yeah. Um, going home that night and um, with the responsibility you have with these people in their lives that you've done everything you can to give them an opportunity to uh, achieve their dreams, I suppose. Yeah. It's pretty much cool. a good. That's a good, uh, cool ending. Maybe, mm. I think. I don't know. We miss anything? What's think so. what's what's uh, um, what's the? I guess you don't know what the future holds, do you? No, nah, um, a little bit. I'm excited about moving into a community role within the footy club, um, at least for the next twelve months, and and impacting maybe a different uh, cohort of people, mm. and and it being in schools and. Um, with a younger crew so yeah I'm, I'm excited about the challenges that that'll present and just want to continue to have an impact on lives really that was the thing with mindfulness i guess i was trying to ask with the off-field on-field stuff like it's certainly like it helped our performances no doubt in my mind and you can you can try to divert some attention to yourself but there there was a collective feeling there was 20 blokes out there that was practicing mindfulness daily effectively in 2018 so you can't tell me that that doesn't have a huge impact. And I know you're not trying to say that either. But mindfulness um, for me, and you talk about doing it with school kids and, and rolling that out, it's something that um, probably affected my life more outside of footy than it did in, in footy as well. So, um, yeah, I don't know. just wanted to say that while I've got a microphone in my, yeah. front of my face. <laughs> I, th- I, know what, I know what you're talking about. It, I mean, <clears throat> for and like, this is probably back to the – it's the experience is different for everyone, like – our personalities are different to yours potentially and, and to the next person. So it works differently. That as a tool works differently for everyone, but it's the same for everything that you get taught. Everyone will um, accept and use it differently. So um, the off-field stuff you talk of, you know, for us, a lot of it being around the emotional regulation and um, finding calm within chaos, you know, that sort of stuff, Yeah. Uh, which what a perfect tool for. And this is just a, a tool in a whole host of um, – 
in a toolkit, but you know, where there's if we're talking about mental health too, there's this is just a, a tool when there's a whole heap of other tools that are available to help people that might be struggling or suffering. So, mm. um, yeah, like examples of that are, and again, this is a footy sense, but sitting in front of the coach and he's going to drop you, and he's just said something that may or may not be true, without mindfulness. <laughs> Scully, 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 I'll tell you right now, Scully <laughs> flying off the chain, angry, uh, it, it, instantly emotional. Mindfulness allowed me, so I won't say allows you, but allowed me to sit and just take it in for maybe a second. And maybe I would still be exactly the same like emotion, but I'd at least thought about it. Like mindfulness is about, sometimes anyway, for me, was about thinking about what I was thinking. And I did, we spoke a lot about that, right? Is that thinking about what's in your mind and those sorts of situations for me I like I had no tools as a young kid with how to deal with them and neither did you no, we're not, similar not similar yeah. similar journeys like that yeah but that was one thing for me it was like instead of just reacting you can still react you just think about it before you react yeah I don't know yes absolutely no that's absolutely and that's your experience and I share a similar one mate uh Martin Nikoski everybody that was bloody brilliant right so good really you're not, good you're not done yet Social media. Part one. Social media. I know you're not a massive man on social media. Well, lucky. We're not going to talk about social media. We're talking about social media. That's right, Nico. I can see you're excited, mate. Social media. Quite a big smile. Man. This is I'm from, shit scared. This, no, <laughs> this is from the people. Right. You've heard from Dan and I. Yeah. This is from the people. And I've got to say, and Nick's over there listening along, this is some of the oh, some went, of the great went huge. I would I would say maybe the most well received social media I've seen. Um in a positive or negative form, it can right? go either way okay. it can go either way volume volume wise volume great. but I, I think there's some great <clears throat> stories as well i'll read that email at some point yeah um so this can be you can answer these short long however you like uh, i don't want to start with that first one i i i, I would like to <laughs> let's start with this one <laughs> this is from andrew ty <laughs> uh why did you go to hungry jack's Glen gary i served you there all the time <laughs> Andrew Ty being scorches Andrew Ty. He's right. Did he really? He was. He was. Was he the manager? He was a manager at Hungry Jacks Glen Gary. Well, good Hungry Jacks, that I, one. Yeah, I don't know. Just the bacon deluxe. And, <laughs> um, what do they put maybe in those? The fifty percent card sort of helped too. Oh, yeah. Um, Cleedy ninety one. Uh, in your time at the club, who would spend the most time in front of the mirror doing their hair care routine? Mickey Braun. <laughs> he said Mickey Braun. Yeah. I mean, Braun, he said that. Did he? We had Braun. <laughs> yeah. you, I mean, you spent a little bit of time in your head, didn't you? Oh, I don't know. Maybe. But let's just read this one out. Beck uh, did a co. Uh, not a question, but forever thankful for Nico. My grandma, an original West Coast, East, uh, West Coast Eagles member, had stage four terminal cancer back in 2010, and he made some visits to her in hospital that were massive uh, mental health boosts, even when the club was on track for its first wooden spoon. And pretty sure he had some injuries. A great footballer and coach, but an even better bloke. Oh, that's really lovely. That is lovely. Yeah. Um, John Dawson. Uh, were you a member of the Eagles before you got drafted? And if so, uh, were your seats on the main wearing wing? Yes. <laughs> great. Yeah. Well, my dad's seat was. Yeah. I'd just go along and he'd somehow get me in and sit next to him and watch. But yeah, there you go. Stephen Carney. Uh, my father-in-law has always said you are his wife's favourite player. Any chance you could say hi, Leanne, so I could send it to her? Hi, Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, oh, Leanne. I don't know why I found that so funny. <laughs> uh, this is not a bad one. Raise uh, 897. Uh, did you do anything different leading into the 2011 season that led to your amazing year? No, not really. Um Train my guts out like I normally would have, and um, it was probably around about that time, which we've already touched on, was the the switch over from investing in others, um, which I think really helped my football. Um, Jimon's images. Uh, what's it like being good at footy and good looking? <laughs> 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 you don't have to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's it like? <laughs> Well, in the in the I would like to I would like you to answer this one because we've had the the great man who was alongside you on the podcast as well, Dada Ham. Uh, what was life like um, as the form model for live clothing back in the mid two thousands? Now we've had Chad Fletcher on, and we spoke to Chad Fletcher about this. You you were the were the pin up boy of live clothing back in the with, day. Now Fletch was the inaugural. So he, was, oh, yeah. he handed the baton to you. Yeah, a bit like the speedos. 
There, yeah. was, oh, we're talking ripped jeans. We're talking v-necks funny sunglasses we're talking yeah. deep sunnies yeah i think i'd still have the book somewhere in there <laughs> i've always had those weird weird mannequins with the giant heads do they yeah yeah yes the jay jaden uh how often do you whip out the guitar and what do you like to play mm. uh, not as much as i'd like over the the last little period of time but a lot of pete murray um paul dempsey uh, Do you still know James uh, Bay. Ignition Remix by R. Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> Prob- no, but <laughs> I did used to know it. <laughs> uh, I think I'm just going to read this email. Hi, yeah, guys. Just seeing the post about Mark Nikoski. Just want to pass on a huge thank you from me. Now, this is a bit... It's a bit rogue, but we like it. As a 10 and 11 year old, I was a huge Eagles fan and was going through some health issues around 2007. I was going into uh, have a defibrillator slash pacemaker put in because of my heart condition and was recently coming to terms with being forced um, to stop playing footy um, for good and scared about what's going to happen in the future. My teacher at the time was a huge Eagles fan. I don't know how still to this day, but it was organised. I was given uh, by my class an Eagles jersey signed by every player and for some reason Chris Judd twice. Um, this is from Aiden Glover by the way this jumper that was signed was an AFL players edition proper long sleeve Eagles jumper I don't know if it was played in but it was Mark Nikoski's number 6 on the back I still don't know if this was actually a jumper of Mark's he gave up to be signed for me but it holds a very special place in my heart sits on um, my uh, cupboard at mum and dad's house some 21 years later I've actually seen Mark out surfing at Smith's a number of times over the years and have never said anything, but always wanted to. If you could, please pass on the thanks. I'd be grateful. Hope he gets a kick out of making an eleven-year-old's day all those years ago. Much love, Aiden Glover. I thought that was a good way. Yeah, to Yeah, that's great. But, uh, make sure you say good day next time, Aiden. Yeah, correct. Um, you you don't bite much. No, you're not. You're not dropping in people out. No, no, no. And no. uh, we always yeah. finish mine, from, mine. from the egg man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do you like your eggs? Um, poached. Martin Nikoski, everybody. Fleet Network, proudly bringing you back chat this year. A big thank you to Swimply, Whippersnapper Whiskey, Mungo River Roasting Co., Blue Bat, Shelter Brewing Co., Little Cameras, Digital, uh, Mumba Digital, ID Athletic, bringing you the Western Fisters this year. You can find all of it at backchatstudios.com.au. Do you have fun, Nico? Thanks for coming.